In this final lecture, I want to concentrate on the fourth basic mission and purpose of the Church, namely demonstrating unity and wholeness. As we said early on, unity and wholeness identifies the Church as a healthy recipient of God's grace and love and as a healthy vehicle uh, for conveying God's grace and love. Now, the ultimate model for our unity is the Trinity itself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united as one in a bond of love. There are three persons in the Trinity, and yet there is only one God. And it's sort of like that with the Church. Um, in, in fact, demonstrating unity and wholeness uh, is a sign that the Church is properly worshiping God. Because how can we say we're properly worshiping Him when we're divided? It's a sign that people are properly being discipled, that Jesus is number one. Because, you know, in the Bible, it was a sign that the disciples did not get it when they were fighting against each other. And, uh, what was it, Peter and no, John and James were saying, we want to be number one, we want to be on your right hand and your left hand. You know, when there's disunity, that is a sign that we are not living rightly with the Lord. And it's a proper sign that we are properly engaging in mission when the people outside of the church can see our love and our oneness, that we are a family, they're going to want to join us. Uh, now, on the night before he died, I mean, let me back up by saying, if there's someone you love, and he knows he's going to die soon, people who are about to die want to tell those they love the most important things on their heart. Uh, they don't talk about just the weather or sports or things like that. Jesus was the same way. The night before he died in John 17, he gave uh, what is known as the high priestly prayer. He was saying the most important things. And what he said in John uh, 14, or rather John 17, uh, verses 19 through 21, he said, For their sakes, my disciples, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the twelve apostles, but for those who also believe in me through their word. In other words, he was praying for us. And what did he pray? Verse 21. This is the key. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The very last thing he was praying was for our unity. That was at the very heart. And he was praying because that was most important to him because he knew he was going to be dying the next day. Now, unity and wholeness uh, in the church flow from the church's very nature. Remember, Jesus prayed that we would all be one. Paul said the same thing. Uh, in Ephesians 4, uh, he uh, prayed that, uh, he said, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So, unity and wholeness were on Jesus' heart, they're on Paul's heart, um, and it is true that we all come from different local churches, and different denominations. And yet, as we said in an earlier lecture, the things that unite us are more important than the things that divide us. The Bible talks about the fact that we are all members of one body, despite our different local churches and different denominations. We have one purpose, one Father, one Spirit, one hope, one faith, one baptism, and one love. The primary things, the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, God is Trinity. There's only one God consisting of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is fully God and fully man. We are sinners who cannot save ourselves by our own efforts. We're only saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are all called to live lives of love. Every Orthodox Christian believes those things. Those are the most important things. Other things the Bible talks about, but is not entirely clear. For example, church government. We said early on uh, that the Bible uh, does not give 
an exhaustive or detailed treatise on church government. And so early on in the church, three different forms of church government arose that are still present today, the Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Congregational forms of government. Um, early on, the issue of do we baptize infants or only professing believers arose. That still exists today. Um, and so those are what I call secondary matters. Um, and then there's man-made matters. You know, does the uh, leader of the church wear a robe or wear a suit? Uh, what is the order of worship? Uh, you know, and other things like that. Um, these are just things made up by people. But what divides us? What divides us is when we put these secondary or man-made things above the primary things. That shows that we really don't value the most important things at all. We value our little individual uh, things. And so, you know, we need to reassess ourselves. What is really most important to us? Now, I think probably in the first lecture, we talked about the different metaphors that the Bible uses to describe the church. And things like, the church is the body of Christ. The church is God's building or temple. The church is God's family. Well, one of the things about all of these uh, metaphors is that the church is not two families. It's one family. It has different members, but we're all united. We all have the same name, just like in an earthly family. A building is one. It needs the walls, the floor, the ceiling, the roof, and so on. If it's lacking all of those, it doesn't exist as a good building. Um, the church is the body. Paul talks about this at length in 1 Corinthians 12, where he says, yes, there's one body with one head. There are different members. Some are the hands, some are the feet, some are the eyes, some are the ears. But a healthy body has all of the, it's only one body, and all of these things are working together for the sake of the whole person. Again, Unity naturally flows from what Christ has done. Christ has reconciled us all to the Father. We're all in the same boat. It's not that some Christians could earn their salvation, but Christ had to save others. No, we're all in the same boat. We were all helpless without him. He saved us all. Further, he broke down the wall that divided people. In the Bible, the only distinction between people that had any theological difference was not the distinction between African and Mazungu. It was not the distinction between this tribe and that tribe. It was not the distinction between men and women. It was not uh, the distinction between the rich and the poor. The only distinction that made any difference was the distinction between Jews and Gentiles. But in Ephesians 2, verses uh, 14 and 15, Paul said this, He himself uh, is our peace, who made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by, establishing, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. You see, Christ broke down the only dividing wall that made any difference at all. And now, all of us, African, Mzungu, male, female, uh, uh, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, this tribe, that tribe, we are all one in Christ, as Paul said in Galatians 3.28. In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, no slave or free, no male or female. We're all one in him. So, that means we need to assess how we do church. When we form leaders, do we just put our personal friends, members of our own family, our tribe, people like us? Not that, That's not the way we should be doing it. Because, again, everything is spiritual. Do we really see people of different tribes, uh, different backgrounds, etc., etc., as our equals in Christ? God has given them spiritual gifts and abilities that he hasn't given me. Um, and all are valuable. He, they are equally saved. So again, unity flows from what Jesus has done for us. Um, and notice, this is so important spiritually. Because in John 17, 21, 
um, it said that he prayed that we would be one so that the world may believe you sent me. In other words, our unity is vital because if we're fighting against each other, I have nothing to do with you of this denomination or of you of this tribe or whatever it is, the world will, will sit back justly and say, why would anyone want to become a Christian? They don't even like each other. But it is our unity in Christ, you see, because Jesus has saved people out of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people in the entire world. And since that is true, he's adopted all of us equally into his family. We're all now part of one new family. Therefore, we should start acting like it, because that is the only thing that will show people uh, that there's something different about Christians. Most people hate people of another tribe, another race, you know, those poor, or those rich, or those this, or those that. But no, in Christ, we have a greater unity, a deeper unity, because despite our differences, and there are differences, we realize you are my brother and sister in Christ. People will see that if we truly act upon it. We talked in an earlier lecture about the church's family, and real families take care of their own. And so when the world sees us taking care of the physical as well as the spiritual needs of people, they will see those Christians have something that we don't have, something that we want. And then when they come into the church and they come to Christ, they should be accepted and loved like members of a beloved family. Now, the apostles emphasized like-mindedness and relational un uh, unity within the church. And again, do we really see our local church as a family? Do we see the broader church as a family? We may say we do, but again, our actions speak louder than words. I'm saying these things because I know that many churches need to take a good, hard look at ourselves. What are we doing with our money? How are we treating people? How are we involved with other churches and other denominations? Um, God, I think, in these lectures and in this book, is calling us to evaluate and change, to get in line with the gospel. Remember, that's what Paul told Peter in um, uh, Galatians uh, 2, verse 14. He said, Peter, you're not acting in line with the gospel. Well, our problem may not be the same as Peter's, but are we acting in line with the gospel? Now, another aspect of this unity and wholeness is unity between different churches and between different denominations. Now, yes, there are different churches and different church traditions, but they all can bring something into the church. It's kind of like a big extended family. Uh, some people, a, a clan, a tribe. Some people live in this town, some people live over there. Some are business people, some are farmers. Some are rich, some are poor, some are educated, some are not. But when we all get together, we should realize that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And different traditions bring different strengths. For example, the Anglican Church is well known for its good organization, it's thought about these things. The Presbyterian Church is known for its scholarship and schools. The Baptist Church known for um, its uh, study of the Word uh, and its dependence upon the Word. The Pentecostal Church is known for their fire and their enthusiasm. You bring all of these things together, it creates a good whole church. Now, this does not mean that if you're a member of one denomination and not another, that you have to give up your distinctives uh, or the things that are important to you. But it does mean that we should be able to work together with others and learn from them and grow from their strengths because they may have dealt with issues uh, that we've really not dealt with very much. That's why God has given us these different parts of the greater family. Now, 
Unity and wholeness are demonstrated in different ways. We can gather together for common worship from time to time. Um, in my country, uh, at the end of the month of November, we have a national holiday called Thanksgiving. And oftentimes on Thanksgiving, a number of different churches uh, from different denominations will gather together for a common Thanksgiving worship service. Sometimes on Easter, different churches gather together for a common Easter service. Um, we can participate in sacraments together. We can have common meals and fellowship with different churches and so on, as we're getting to know them, you see. Also, sharing and helping others materially. I talked in an earlier lecture about if you have developed a good discipleship program in your church, you should consider reaching out to other churches, including other den denominations, and try to help them develop a good discipleship program. Um, but I have known of some churches, they see a new church that is starting in their area, might even be a different denomination, but they realize that's not a threat to me, that's helping to build up the body of Christ. And so I know, uh, I was told by a pastor uh, somewhere in East Africa that he knows of this and that it may have been his church that he provided some financial assistance to help that new church plant get going. Um, and most importantly, working together where we can. Uh, I used the example, uh, I think in the uh, last lecture, of the Muslims who in Dar es Salaam and Kigali, Muslim women, they come every Friday. They bring meals to all of the people in the church, or in, in the hospital. And uh, both the bishop in Kigali and in um, Dar es Salaam said, no church has ever done that. And I said, I can understand that. You might say, well, my church is too small. I couldn't afford that. And I'd say, you're right. But if your church gets together with his little church and with her little church, among all of you, you could do a lot. But we've never thought about that. And so think about this. When those patients get out of hospital and they have some need, do you think they're more likely to go to the church or to the mosque for help? Well, the answer is obvious. Because the Muslims in the mosque reached out to them and showed that they cared, those pe and the church never did, those people are more likely to go to the mosque. Those Muslims are doing what the church should be doing and what the church historically has done. You can do it a little bit from this, a little bit from that church, a little bit from that one. You add it all together and it translates to great, great things. So the simplest way, of course, is to begin working with another church from your denomination. Secondly, work with churches from, you know, similar denominations. If, for example, you're a Pentecostal from one particular Pentecostal denomination, work with other Pentecostals, because um, you have a lot in common. But that can lead to crossing the denominational borders, because in principle, whether you're a Pentecostal, an Anglican, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, you all are agreeing on the most important things for crying out loud. So set aside some of your prejudices. Get to know the leaders of the other churches. You're going to find this is a great man or woman of God. I never knew it. You never knew it because you never stepped outside yourself and you never tried to demonstrate the unity that Christ, the night before he died, called us to demonstrate. Now, Part of unity and wholeness is that, uh, you see, if we are neglecting the other major um, missions and purposes of the church, um, worship, discipleship, and mission, that means we're out of balance. But as we do these things, our unity is going to grow. Um, and so the, uh, the important thing that we need to understand is that unity and wholeness, they start with the individual, and they're both physical and spiritual. I talked in another uh, lecture about, suppose you have uh, in the church some person whose old person, the roof of their house leaks, okay? That's a physical problem. They can't fix it themselves. Or a person who needs money for school fees, or who needs a job. Okay, those are physical problems. 
Now, they'll go to church, but, you know, if the church is doing nothing to help them physically, they're probably not going to learn spiritually, okay? We're whole and united when we're physically and spiritually whole. We talked in terms of mission, of going into the community, and as you deal with the physical needs of poverty, orphans, HIV, AIDS, whatever it is, they will be receptive to hearing you speak spiritually. And so, again, wholeness begins with the individual, and it is physical as well as spiritual. We have talked about this throughout these lectures, even going back to worship, because remember, worship at its root is a mindset. There's the broad form of worship and the narrow form of worship. The broad form is how we live our lives through the week. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, um, and John indicated in 1 John 4.20, if we don't have the broad form of worship, how we live during the week in our interaction with people, we worship him in vain on Sundays. He does not accept our narrow form of worship. So again, worship, discipleship, and mission all are holistic. They involve the whole person, physical as well as spiritual. That has to become the mindset of our churches. If it does, you will be transformed. You will be amazed at how God starts working through you. Now, the Apostles' Call, so it begins with the, at the individual level, but the Apostles' Call for Unity largely was directed to matters within the local churches. Um, and in other words, the Apostles were emphasizing the relational unity within the churches. Um, and so Jesus said, um, people will know you're my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. It's our love for one another that shows we are his disciples. And love is expressed tangibly. It's not just, oh, I love you, I'll pray for you. No, if the person needs money for school fees, he doesn't need your prayers. He needs money for school fees. And so there are ways you can do this. Um, you know, if the person's roof leaks, he doesn't need your prayers. Prayer is not going to fix that directly. But getting up on the roof with new iron sheets or with hammers and nails or whatever, that will fix it. Those are tangible things uh, that will bring about unity within the body. Forgiveness and reconciliation. This family hates that family. We have a course on forgiveness and reconciliation. Once they are forgiveness and reconciliation takes place, you're going to see a new dynamic among your people. Another uh, important aspect of unity, of course, is between denominations. We talked a little bit about that. Um, and so, you know, my point here is that unity is from the, lo uh, from the individual level, with to, it moves to within the local churches, all the way to uh, between different churches and different denominations. So, as we start worshiping, true worship, we are going to be united. As we start discipling, as people are discipled, they are naturally going to be united because they're going to see the implications of the gospel for all aspects of their lives, and they're going to realize, how can I have this thing against this person? How can I have nothing to do with him or her? Am I acting like Christ? I can't do that. And as we reach out in mission to our village and our community, um, people are going to come into the church. The church will grow. They will see the love and unity. It, it's a cycle, you see. As we do the other three basic missions and purposes of the church, worship, discipleship, and mission, we're naturally going to become more unified. And that will lead to greater worship, greater discipleship, and greater mission. It's like this ever-increasing spiral that gets bigger and bigger. That's exactly the way Jesus wants his church to be. Um, and so, you know, Jesus said, or I'm sorry, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, he talked about the church as the body. He said, if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. That is unity. That's the way the church should be. 
taking care of the poor and downtrodden, the suffering, and rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. And as we take care of the poor and downtrodden and suffering, they will cease being poor, downtrodden, and suffering, and they will begin rejoicing. This stuff is so wonderful if we get it. So let me conclude by saying this. Um, all, doing all of the first three primary missions and purposes of the church, worship, discipleship, and mission, will result in unity and wholeness and will lead to an increase in worship, discipleship, and mission. You see, that's the attitude of worship. That is the nature of love. When the church is doing what it is supposed to be doing, we can rest assured that, as Paul says, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. To the end that, as Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Christ will be glorified both now and forever. And the gates of hell will not prevail uh, because the church will be doing what it is supposed to be doing. It will be fulfilling its mission. It will be glorifying God. It will be reaching out to the lost. Jesus will be pleased and he will be leading you. And let me just, my final word here is when Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church if we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. That shows, a lot of churches think, well, they, they think, oh, the world is bad out there. We don't want the world into the church. They don't have a kingdom mindset. So they huddle together. But that's wrong. When he says the gates of hell will not prevail, in his day, in the big cities had walls around the city with a big gate that was closed at night to keep the bad guys out. Now, when Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, the picture he's painting is the church is going out into the world and you know uh, uh, storming the gates of hell storming the gates of the world to bring the people who God has chosen into the church it shows the church on the offense not on the defense it shows us going out into the world in mission why because we worship and love God and we have been well discipled so that we know uh, the gospel. We know what we believe. We know why we believe it. We can relate it to others. It has affected our family. It's affected our job. It's affected our finances. It's affected everything about, it, about us. And everybody will be able to see that in us and in the church. We're united uh, as a body and when that happens, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against your church and the church as a whole. So God bless you. Uh, I hope uh, you have learned some things about the church. The book obviously has more details uh, on these things. But I pray that you think about these things, you evaluate and assess your own church, you start implementing and applying them, and as I said in an earlier lecture, if you do, Christ is going to start leading you. There are going to be changes. Your church is not going to be the same in a year or three or five or ten from the way it is now. And you are going to look back and say, Oh Jesus, I never knew it could be this good.